All right, then the next talk will also be given from uh, someone from HBS, uh, Elizabeth Paulson, and uh, she'll be talking about outcome-driven dynamic refugee assignment with allocation balancing, which is joint work with Kirk Bansack. Elizabeth, take it away. All right, thank you so much. And thanks everyone for, for being here. Sorry, I'm not there in person, but thank you for indulging the um, remote presentations. So yes, today I'm gonna to be talking about the geographic assignment of refugees from an optimization perspective. And this is work with my collaborator, Kirk Bansack, who is a political science professor at UC Berkeley. So there's over 26 million refugees in the world right now. These are one of the most vulnerable populations. They've been forced to flee their home country and are currently awaiting resettlement into a host country. So the stated goal of resettlement programs is to assist the refugees in, a, in achieving economic self-sufficiency by resettling them into a specific location. Um, unfortunately, refugees do still have consistently lower labor market participation and other outcomes than non-refugee groups. And so the goal of this work is to propose a low cost but high impact intervention, which is a data driven and optimization approach to dynamic geographic assignment of refugees. So I first just want to give sort of a rough outline of how this um, resettlement process works. So most refugees are awaiting resettlement in a, a camp, and at some point they will be allocated to a host country. Once they arrive at that host country, they'll be assigned to a specific locality within that host country. And today I'm going to be focusing on the U.S. context. And in the U.S., there's one other step in this process, which is that before being assigned to a location, the refugee family is first assigned to one of seven resettlement agencies. And these are nonprofits that the government contracts with to support the resettlement of refugees. And each resettlement agency has their own network of locations that they work with. So, for example, this is one uh, network for one of the largest resettlement agencies in the U.S., each, the size of each purple dot is showing the number of refugees that are resettled in that location per year on average. So currently in the status quo in the U.S., the decisions about where to place newly arriving refugees are up to individuals called placement officers that work at these resettlement agencies. And so when a new family arrives, they might sort of see um, a set of covariates on their computer screen and they'll have to decide what location to assign that case to. And these decisions must obey capacity, a number of constraints, one of which is capacity constraints. So every fiscal year in the US, new capacities are set for each location that have to be obeyed throughout the year. There also might be medical constraints or educational constraints. And if the refugee already has existing family in the US, they'll automatically be assigned to that location. So currently in the status quo, there's really no sort of systematic optimization or personalization of these decisions. The goal is really to satisfy constraints and keep these um, sort of balanced over time. Furthermore, in the US, the only outcome for the refugees that is systematically tracked and reported back to the government is 90 day employment. This is a binary outcome, which indicates whether or not the refugee found employment 90 days after arrival. So surprisingly, the location that a refugee is initially assigned to actually seems to have massive consequences on their employment rate. So this is showing the employment rate for 43 different locations. And if we look, for example, at the um, locations with the lowest employment rate, it's under 10 percent versus the locations with the highest employment rates have rates of around 30 or even 40 percent. And this is pretty surprising given that what we see in the data is that the assignment process is actually somewhat random, right? So it's not as though certain types of refugees are systematically being sent to certain locations. It really is a location fixed effect that's going on. But it's not as though every location is sort of created equal. There are synergies that exist between ref refugee covariates and locations. So these two plots are showing the marginal effect of different covariates on the probability 
of employment in Atlanta on the left and Denver on the right. So for example, if we look at the importance of speaking English, we see that in Atlanta, it has no significant effect, but in Denver, there's a significant positive effect of speaking English. And furthermore, you can see a lot of heterogeneity in terms of the effect of different nationalities. And so really the goal of this work is to try to both detect and then exploit the synergies that we can find between people and places to try to find a better placement approach for the newly arriving refugees. So in this work, I'm going to present um, a minimum, what we call a minimum discord online assignment algorithm for the dynamic assignment of refugees over time. And our goal in this algorithm is to maximize average 90 day employment. We'll see that it has near optimal performance on real world US re refugee resettlement data, but I'll show you that maximizing employment can actually result in severe imbalance over time. So there might be some locations that receive you know, more than their share of cases at a certain period of time and vice versa. And this is undesirable because it leads to an imbalanced workload for the placement officers. And so we then propose an allocation balancing modification to the algorithm. And we find that we can achieve near perfect balance with a very small loss in employment outcomes. And then I'll also discuss two ancillary benefits of allocation balancing as well. All right, so the overall approach of this method really has two stages. In the first stage, we develop a machine learning uh, model to predict employment probabilities for all cases at all locations. I'm not gonna be talking about that stage today just due to time constraints. And today I'm gonna be focusing on the second stage, which is the matching algorithm. And so for the second stage, I'm just gonna assume that for every case that arrives, we can observe their vector of employment probabilities at all possible locations. So if we knew exactly who was going to arrive in the future, we could simply solve the classic offline assignment problem. So here, capital T is my horizon length, which in the US is each fiscal year, because that's when the capacities are reset. And I'm also just gonna assume for simplicity that there's one arrival in each time period. So T is both the number of arrivals and the length of the horizon. WTJ is the probability of case T finding employment at location J. And these are really what we estimate in stage one. And I'm gonna assume that they're known um, throughout this talk. SJ is the capacity of location J, and then Z, TJ are my binary decision variables, which is whether I assign case T to location J. So if I knew exactly who was going to arrive throughout the fiscal year, I could just solve this offline assignment problem. And it's well known that although these Zs are binary, we can relax that condition and solve it as a linear program and still get a binary solution. So solving the offline assignment problem is extremely fast. So for example, if I knew that these nine cases were going to arrive in the future and I had three locations, each with three slots, I could solve the offline assignment problem and get this optimal matching. But of course, in reality, we don't know who's going to arrive in the future. And so instead, for every arrival, we're gonna simulate future arrivals m times, where m is just some large constant, where we sample future arrivals from past arrivals. So I'm gonna fix case one, which is the current arrival, and continue to sample future arrivals from my historical data. And so, and each time I'm gonna solve the static or offline assignment problem. Then I'm gonna look at where in each of these M instances, the current case was assigned to. And I'm gonna actually assign the current case to the location that they were most often assigned to out of these M random instances. And then I'll update my capacities and move on to the next person. And we call this the minimum discord algorithm. This is actually a special case of the Bayes selector method that was proposed um, by Vera and Banerjee, which minimizes the probability of disagreement between an online decision and an offline benchmark. And it's also worth noting that there's another algorithm that's been proposed for the same context in which there's still, by Ahani et al, in which they still um, solve M random instances of the offline problem, but then instead of looking at where the current case has been assigned, they use the dual variables of the capacity constraints as bid prices. And it turns out that these methods are actually quite similar and seem to produce similar results as well. 
So I'm going to show the results of this algorithm on data from one of the largest resettlement agencies in the US using data from 2012 to 2016. Um, we have sort of standard covariates for this cohort, such as age, gender, family size, and so on. We also observe where each family was actually assigned to in reality and their outcome, which is whether or not they found employment 90 days after arrival. So I'm going to ask the question of what would have happened if we had used our proposed algorithm to assign the 2016 arrivals in reality. So all the rest of the data I use as my training data to build the predictive models. And the 2016 arrivals are my test cohort. So I'm going to pretend as though in I use my online um, minimum discord algorithm to assign these cases in the order in which they actually arrived in reality. So we find that the minimum discord algorithm achieves 95% of the hindsight optimal solution, which is the um, best possible uh, matching that I could have achieved if I knew all of the arrivals ahead of time. All right, so I just take all of the 2016 arrivals and I solve the offline matching problem, and that's my hindsight optimal benchmark. We can also compare this to three other benchmarks, which are a greedy approach, the actual assignment, which is where these cases were actually assigned in reality, as well as a random benchmark where each case is just randomly assigned to a location that has available capacity. And I want to point out that this 5% optimality gap between our method and the hindsight optimal solution is primarily due to non-stationarity in the actual arrival process. And that if we, rand if we um, randomly shuffle the arrival dates in order to mimic a stationary process, the optimality percentage actually jumps to 99.5%. But let's dive a little bit deeper into what this um, algorithm is actually doing. And so here I'm showing the allocation over time to the nine locations that have the largest capacity. And what you can see is that some locations, such as location four and seven, tend to be over, oversubscribed at the beginning of the period, and then they both run out of capacity about halfway through the period. Whereas locations five and six don't seem to receive very many cases at the beginning of the horizon, and then they jump up in their, alloc in their assignments towards the end of the horizon. And this imbalance is really due to the non-stationarity of the data. And I should also mention that it's not just due to our algorithm being suboptimal. If you actually looked at the offline um, hindsight optimal solution, you would see a similar pattern. It's really caused here by non-stationarity. Because if all we care about is maximizing outcomes and a group of similar cases arrives you know, in a similar time frame, then if we just want to maximize employment, there's really no reason that we wouldn't send all those cases to the same location. But in practice, this is highly undesirable because it leads to an imbalanced workload for the placement officers, as well as other workers that are helping these refugees get set up with housing and other benefits. And so I wanna um, propose a solution that increases balance, but first I have to introduce a queuing model, which is how we really um, measure the, the imbalance in the system. So I'm gonna assume that every location has a processing rate, rho, which we can think of as how many cases that location can process in one time period. And by process, what I mean is set up the family with housing and benefits, enroll the children in school, et cetera. And because resettlement officers cannot move between locations, we really want to maintain a balanced workload for them. So by applying this queuing model, we see that in the outcome maximizing algorithm or the minimum discord algorithm, the average wait time is about two weeks. And furthermore, locations are idle about 18% of the time. So in order to combat this imbalance, we propose a modification to the offline problem, which essentially penalizes wait time. So wait time here is shown in blue. BJT is the buildup at time T at location J, which is just the number of people both in the queue and being processed. Um, you know, don't worry about the math here. The, the, the key takeaway is just that we're sort of adding a penalty to wait time. And gamma 
is a parameter either set by the researchers or the policymakers that balances how much we care about having a balanced allocation versus how much we care about maximizing employment outcomes. So the problem with this formulation is that it's no longer a linear program, um, which means that it could actually be quite slow to solve this problem in practice, um, if we, especially if we need to solve it you know, many times for each arrival. Um, so instead of a linear program, it can now be written as a mixed integer program. So, but it turns out that actually sort of penalizing full total wait time over the entire horizon is not actually necessary. And instead we can take a greedy approach to allocation balancing, which means that we're only gonna penalize sort of the wait time that the current case experiences, and we're not gonna worry about future cases in terms of wait time. This will preserve the LP structure of the problem, and we also show that it has strong empirical performance. So the intuition here is that, right, as we all know, the greedy approach does not work very well if we're trying to maximize outcomes. And the problem is that when you take a slot from a certain location, it has consequences down the line. But in terms of wait time, that's not necessarily true because you sort of have this renewal process happening, right? Where if we assign a case to a certain location, eventually that case will be done processing at that location. And so it's really only an issue for future arrivals if we have arrivals that arrive during that processing time that would have also liked to go to that location. So it's a bit different than sort of maximizing outcomes, and it turns out that a greedy solution for balancing actually works quite well. So we can see the results as gamma varies. Um, increasing gamma should generally decrease employment, but also drastically decrease wait time. And that's exactly what we see in this figure, with one caveat, which is that it seems that by a very slight uh, positive gamma of 0 0.001, we actually get a slight increase in employment um, this was, you know, unexpected, and we think that this is due to sort of idiosyncrasies in the data and really due to the non-stationarity in the data. Um, but in general, we see that as gamma increases, the employment rate falls and average wait time also falls. So I want to now zoom in on a particular gamma of 0 0.005. And so if we had chosen this gamma, then we can see already just visually that the allocation over time is much more balanced. The average wait time is now just under two days and locations are only idle about 4% of the time. And furthermore, the employment level is 98% of what the employment level was when we were just maximizing outcomes. Elibit so Elizabeth, sorry, let me interrupt you. Um, you're out of time, so could you maybe wrap up? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yes, I, this is basically the last slide. I'll skip over the additional benefits and just say that the, all of this work is part of um, the Immigration Policy Lab's GeoMatch team at Stanford University. Um, and these algorithms are actually currently implemented in a pilot in Switzerland um, with new pilots um, in process in other countries as well. So thank you very much and sorry for going over time. Thanks, everyone. Would you mind just coming up and asking your question there? Right. Hi. Uh, uh, Hi. Uh, so I'm wondering, uh, first of all, can the refugee family actually refuse an offer? Like, can they defer? And secondly, um, don't you think the probability should be path dependent in the sense that you have, if you were to assign a bunch of uh, a certain language speaker to, let's say, uh, a fixed location, then their employment probability should be conditional on that. Thanks. Yeah, so to answer your first question, um, which was, wait, sorry, can you remind me what the first part was? I just blanked. But, okay, I'll answer the second part first, which is that we currently don't consider sort of the endogeneity of our most recent assignments but we do sort of periodically update our predictive models to capture changes in, in the locations, right? So if after a while, a certain type of refugee is like being assigned to a certain location and that creates more synergies, 
then we will capture that in the models at some, like once we update the models. So we're not really doing it in real time, but we're doing it kind of on a on a longer scale. And then can you remind me what the first part was? Yeah. Whether declining is possible for refugees. Ah, yeah. uh, yes. So no, um, that is unfortunately not possible. Um, the Currently, the host countries that we work with do not solicit preferences from refugees, nor do they currently have the ability to decline. Um, however, I will mention that, you know, the families do not have to remain in the location that they are resettled to. They are free to move throughout the U.S. Um, however, they would forego certain benefits if they move before 90 days are up. So most cases do remain in the location that they're assigned to for at least 90 days. Thank you. Thank you again.